Welcome to this uh, Rackham Centennial Lecture. Uh, this is uh, this event sponsored by uh, the Rackham, uh, so the Rackham School, as well as the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, and co-sponsored by the Center for Chinese Studies, the NAM Center for Korean Studies, and uh, LSNA. And we're grateful for all of you uh, coming today. Uh, crowded day on campus with homecoming festivities, and we appreciate you making your way through the dentist downstairs, and maybe picked up a snack or two on the way as you came up. Uh, the, uh, um, I wanted to introduce our uh, guest of honor speaker today, uh, that is Michael uh, J. Dunn. Uh, Michael is an alumnus of the uh, University of Michigan. Uh, three weeks after he finished his program here, got an MBA and an MA in Southeast Asian Studies, uh, he boarded a flight and flew off to Thailand, and uh, after being there for a little while, founded the Automotive Resources Asia, uh, a car consultancy. Uh, ARA expanded operations in China and Southeast Asia over the next decade and became recognized as a leading authority uh, on Asia's emerging car markets, uh, um, uh, working uh, from everywhere from China to, to India and everything in between. In 2006, ARA was acquired by J.D. Power and Associates, and uh, Michael was named Vice President and Managing Director for, for China and was based there in, in Shanghai. Uh, and he's now president of Dunn & Company, a Hong Kong-based investment advisory firm specializing, specializing on Asia's, in Asia's car markets. He's the author of a 2000 book that I know some of you have seen, American Wheels, Chinese Roads, the story of American Wheels and Chinese Roads, the story of General, Motor, General Motors in China. His, uh, his commentaries and editorials have been uh, published in the Wall Street Journal, International Herald Tribune, Management Review, uh, Automotive News. Uh, he's also uh, appeared and been interviewed as guests on uh, Bloomberg, uh, CNBC, CNN, CNN, and NPR. Uh, he's a native of Detroit, so he's from the area. He speaks Chinese and Thai, and he's worked in uh, Beijing, Shanghai during the 1990s and 2000s, also in Thailand, and now dis uh, divides his time between China and Jakarta, where he lives with his wife uh, and their three children. Uh, delighted to have him with us today, and please join me in welcoming Michael Dunn. Thank you, Alan. Uh, it's great to be back here in America, back home to Michigan. I make it back three, four times a year, and every time it gets better. Like fine wine, it gets better with time. But uh, to get things rolling, I got a couple of questions for you. Uh, number one, who watched the debates last night? Okay, big, big showing. Lots of people watching the debates. And second question is even easier. If you watched the debates, you were probably going to vote, right? How many people are planning to vote? It's only 25 days away. Well, I highly encourage everyone to execute that privilege uh, because it's, it's an important and valuable privilege and one that's not shared in every country around the world as we know. But more importantly in my mind, voting is important because it allows us to remember our human condition. And our human condition is this, that as adults, I was reading this in the Financial Times recently, a columnist wrote this, it's an entirely my idea, but as adults, one of the most terrifying things we have to confront is that moment where we make a decision about something without knowing whether it's the right decision or the wrong decision. That's terrifying. And I remember as a graduate student here, and undergrad and graduate student, before leaving school, I used to think I loved the feeling of campus, the familiarity, the comfort of it. What's going to happen when I go out in the real world, so to speak, and have to make some decisions that may go right or may go wrong? And I asked lots of people, well, how do you make that transition? They said, you got to find out on your own. Uh, what, many people said there's no single answer. But follow your passion. Just follow your passion. Whatever your passion is, you can't go wrong. OK, I, I think that's worth a bet. What happens, though, if you're not sure what your passion is, or if your passion isn't quite there? I just asked, last night I was at dinner with my nephew, godson in Gross Point. He's in eighth grade. I said, all right, John, uh, JP, tell me about your school. What are your favorite classes? Hmm. Jim? <laughs> okay, after Jim, what comes up to your mind? He goes, lunch break's pretty good. <laughs> okay. So this is um, 
when we have a passion, it makes our choices easier. When we don't, that's also part of living. You can go many years. Some people go a whole lifetime without finding that passion. Uh, still, the decisions are going to come at us. Robert Frost wrote about it in a poem, right? Two roads diverge in the yellow wood. Sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then what did he do? He took the other. He took the other. That's pretty intense. So time and time again in my years since I left school, I found not because I wanted it to come to me, but these types of decisions come at us. And we have to go this way or that way. And through experience, I realized that decision is important, but it's not the end. So say you go down the wrong path. Or, yeah, you go down the wrong path, and you make a mistake. Or it's not working out as planned. That happens a lot. And when that happens, it becomes a test of one's ability to adjust and negotiate your way through to something better. So if you said, oh, I'm going to go down this path, it's going to be heaven. You go down the path, it turns out to closer to hell. Then you work out, you go, well, I'm purgatory. I'm north of purgatory. Okay, I'm doing okay. All right. Um, what I'd like to do today is... Um, share a couple of stories from two milestones, if you will, in my life. That is questions people often ask me. Number one, Mike, how did you get a company started? I don't want to know when you were big or when you sold. I'd like to know how did that thing start out? What went right, right and what went wrong? And the second um, is how did you write a book? How does that work? I'd love to write a, I'd like to write a book. Maybe many, anybody out here thinking about writing a book? Hands? Come on. <laughs> Pete, okay, Pete, Sarah. Got a couple. If you're even giving it 1% considering, do it. It'll be really tough, but extremely rewarding. Maybe the most rewarding thing you can do with your time. Write a book, a very personal experience, but a very rewarding one. So we're going to talk about how, building a company, and we're going to talk about writing a book, how those got started. But in order to put those two into context, first of all, I want to back up a little bit and talk just a little bit about my years here at Michigan, and in particular, what I consider my greatest passion. No, what is definitely my greatest passion, that is language. I'm just crazy about language. Some people are crazy. Some engineers love an engine of a car. Wow, look at that explosion. Awesome. Spark plug, gas, air. Whew. They do it their whole lives, and all they can think is, can I make this faster and use less gas? I, that's just, anybody else doing anything else with their lives? Why would they any, anybody do anything else? Okay, so for some people, it's engines. For me, it's getting into the, the language itself as it stands alone, and more importantly, how do people use that language to communicate their message. And in our crowded world, crowded world, it's going to get more and more important for us to be able to communicate in an effective way. A couple highlights from school. So uh, if I give, if I thought about coming here and saying, what's my one-page resume, it kind of jumps around, circuitous. Uh, I was a French, ma French literature major in undergraduate school, went to France, junior year abroad, Cour Mirabeau, Aix-en-Provence, drinking my cafe with my professor, and I go, dig in life here in Europe. I think I, I'm going to work here in Europe someday. He goes, no, Europe is the past, America's the future. Mike, you need to go. Uh, America's the present. You need to go to the future, Asia. So inspired by that conversation, I came back my senior year, French literature major, liberal arts, thinking about maybe working in the embassy one day, and I took... Chinese 101 as a, an elective. 
Uh, Tao Laosher was the professor at the time. Extremely demanding, relentless teacher. I just remember her facial expressions. If you got it wrong, it was as if you betrayed humanity. Okay. <laughs> if you got it right, and you got it wrong a lot. You got, if I got it right, a tiny little knot. Tiny! I live for those, I live for those knots. Okay. So inspired was I with her instruction that by the end of my senior year, everyone's going to get a job. I stayed over the summer, took intensive second, second year Chinese, and decided this is the direction I want to go in. I, China, China, Michael Oxenberg was here. Um, Kenneth Lieberthal, went very, very inspiring time to be interested in China. We won't date it, just know it was a few years ago. Mid-80s. I was so absorbed with Chinese language, so into Chinese language, I used to go home on the weekends. My family's from Gross Point, And uh, Friday night, I'd come home, and I'd get the yellow legal pad out, and I'd be writing the character Yong, you know, a hundred times. Wow, this is great. Have some Deng Lijun music on. I'm in the den. So much so that my parents started to get worried. I'm one of seven children. I remember one Friday night, my dad came and he goes, Mike, here's, uh, here's 20 bucks. Why don't you just go to the bar and have some beers with your buddies? I mean, I mean stop writing the characters here. So it was that much uh, I was into. I didn't know what I was going to do. Didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew I liked Chinese. Michael Oxenberg arranged uh, for an internship in China. And uh, initially, I was supposed to go to Beijing and be on CCTV. That would have been super cool. And that was, he's let, set that up, and then I got a call from him one day. He goes, good news, bad news, good news, bad news, CCTV off. Good news, there's still another option. It's called Chongqing. 1985 Chongqing, 2012 Chongqing. Not, not the first choice, yeah? <laughs> not the first choice. But at that moment, I said, Chongqing, is it in China? Yeah. Okay, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. So I went to Chongqing, came back, and enrolled after a year of studying there and, and teaching um, at the university. Uh, I mean, uh, studying Tang Dynasty poetry, they're just nuts. Come back, and I, I enrolled in Michigan's joint degree program. That's uh, study Asian studies and an MBA. Lane Hall, Tappan. Two completely different universes. Lane Hall, Tappan. They used to joke, you know, my classmates at the China Center would say, you're going over to the business school? Yeah. Form over content. Form over content. You got no content in the business school. Lots of money. It's all form over there. And there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of truth in that. So let me speed up a little bit. So how do we get uh, China? I'm studying Chinese. Then Dr. Linda Lim, I met her in my first year of the, of the joint degree program. And this is really interesting, because as you guys know, she is, Dr. Lim, could you stand up for a moment? I think everybody knows you, but yeah, in the lift. She's from Singapore. She's Chinese ethnicity. And she says, Mike, you're studying Chinese in business. Maybe you want to study Thai. Thai. You're, you're Chinese. Yeah, yeah, but you don't want to put all your eggs into the Chinese basket. Things might go wrong. This is about a year before Tiananmen. So with that inspiration, I also started to take Thai. And after graduating in 1990, um, as Alan explained, I, I, all my classmates in the business school were taking their jobs at GM, Ford, and Chrysler and making money. And I said, that, that's... One, let me go the other path. What the hell? So I got on a plane and I went to Bangkok. And I arrived full of vim and vigor. Michigan MBA, speaking Chinese, Thai. I'm ready to go. And I got there and I met uh, some people from General Motors who were setting up there to a plant, getting ready to set up a plant. And I remember the early meetings. It was brutal. So you're here. How long? Um, three weeks. Okay, good. You know anybody? No. You got a company? Yeah, yeah, I got a company. How many people in the company? Including me, or you just want me to round it? One. 
<laughs> and clients, can I see a list of references? What other clients have you, you know, do you have in the pocket before coming to see us, General Motors? Zero. You want to talk about a beating to your confidence and your ego? Just sit down through a few of those meetings. So you do what you can. You, I'm sitting there. I got a stack of student loan coupons. I don't know if they still do. It's probably all electronic, but they used to give you a gift at graduation. Here's your student loan coupons. Good luck for the next 25 years. <laughs> so I took those with me to Bangkok. And they used to sit on my desk. I remember I said, I got to do something. I owe money. I'm borrowing more money to try to start a company that no one believes can get off the ground. And I ended up being um, approached by a publishing company in Detroit. And they said, uh, will you write a, a report on the Thai auto industry? And I said, does it pay? Yes. OK, I'll write it. So I, I needed to get interviews, though, to get, of course, I promised the publishing company, ah, I'm, I'm really wired in Thailand. I know everybody. I can get access. This will be a snap not. So I, I, I got the commission to write the p report. And very fortunate, through fortunate la and the language, I was able to contact not the presidents of these auto companies that I was supposed to interview, but the PAs, the personal assistants or executive assistants. And that went really well. I found that by speaking politely and in a friendly manner to the PAs, they would Go, they wouldn't ask too much about me or my background or how many people I had in my company. They just said, okay, we can see the president. I got that at Toyota, Honda, um, Suzuki, Mazda, Ford, GM, every company except for one, Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi. To this day, I have nightmares about Mitsubishi. <laughs> Mitsubishi, I call, and I'm very polite the same way. She's very polite, Thai woman, but firm. Mr. Dunn, you're not going to get an appointment with the president of our company. Sorry. Not going to happen. So I called a couple of times, a third time, fourth time. Pretty soon, the deadline for my report is coming up, and, I, and I've got this nightmare of, here's the report, Mitsubishi chapter, blank pages. Not good. I don't finish the report and get the Mitsubishi section done. I don't get paid. So what should I do? Anybody got any idea? ideas that I should have thought of at the time, but I didn't. What do you do in that situation? Pay, payday is over here. Between you and payday is Mitsubishi not cooperating. Any, any volunteers? Yes. Sorry? Try the VP. That would have been a good idea. I wish I had the wisdom. But stubborn. No, going to see the president. Should have seen the VP. Try his family. Who said that? Great idea. Where was that thinking? That's another great idea. Try the family route, obligation. I know you, and you know so-and-so, and kind of you know, but so could I, as a favor. That's a really, really good way to do it. Any other ones? No, I think that you guys nailed it. I didn't do those. Instead, I go, well, let's go with what works, you know, Big Ten football straight down the field, blocking and tackling. Let's just get direct with her. You know, Thailand, this, they love being direct in confrontation. <laughs> so I went right at it. Good afternoon, Miss Suwani. You know my voice by now. Yep, ka, ka, I know you. Uh, listen, I really want to be honest with you. You and your company need to be in this report. Really need to be in this report. If you're not in the report, can you imagine what an embarrassment will be to your company if all the other companies are featured in this report that's going to be published worldwide and everyone's going to read it and there will be a chapter on Mitsubishi that has a big X on it? Is that something that you think is a good idea to happen, Ms. Suwani? And, okay, I was so proud of myself. I said, let me pause for a minute and listen to her say, yes, Mr. Dunn, I understand. You're right. I don't know why I didn't see the light before. So I paused to hear this sort of capitulation. But instead, what I heard was some shuffling of paper and some people's foots, feet moving around. So I listened more carefully, and my face starts turning red, and my ears hot. And I realize Ms. Suwani has taken the phone and put it down on the desk and walked away. 
She didn't hang up. She didn't curse me. She didn't lecture me, you're not in America, you're in Thailand, we don't do it that way. She simply put the phone down and allowed me to draw my own conclusions about what the hell I was doing. Okay. Now, at this moment, you guys are going, nice story, entertaining. What does it have to do with building a company? I'm getting there. At the same time I was having my difficulties with Mitsubishi, Chrysler, by coincidence, come into the market, and Chrysler makes Jeep Jeeps, has always made Jeeps. They make a Jeep Cherokee. Chrysler had ambitions to build the Jeep Cherokee in Thailand, too. So an Australian-American guy named Kerry Ivan comes in, and he's got the Jeep, and he, he had, I had lunch with him once, met Mr. Ivan, would you like some services? I'm here, available. Not right, not yet, not yet, Mike. maybe in five years from now. So he comes in and he looks at the market and he finds out Mitsubishi is already producing the only Jeep in Thailand. The, it's called the Pajero there, I think it's called the Montero here. And he goes, great, there is demand for Jeeps. We compete with the Montero worldwide, the Cherokee, versus same price point, same specifications, whatever sales they have, we're bound to at least split their sales in half. We'll take half, and I'll be making my bonus from day, year one. This was Mr. Ivan's thinking. Then he went into some investigation. He looked at the price of the Padero versus the Cherokee, and his team did a, what they call price walk. And they found out that the retail price of the Mitsubishi, $30,000, all in. And they kept doing the calculation for the Cherokee, and they found $45,000. $45,000, there's a 50% 50, 50 more expense. How could this be? Nowhere in the world were the two products priced so differently. So with some more investigation, they found out that Mitsubishi had discovered a loophole. Anybody here work in the auto industry? I'm going to do a little bit of a dive into engineering, but it's not too complicated. In Thailand, Pickup trucks, pickup trucks are subject to no tax at all, zero. Cars are subject to, say, 40% tax. Mitsubishi took its Pajero, assembled it as a pickup truck in a plant just outside of Bangkok. Mitsubishi pickup truck, zero tax. Drove it across the road and to another assembly area and put the top on turning it from a pickup truck into a Pajero. And the tax was, was, there was a tax place, but it was placed on the body part, roughly 20% of the car. Not 80% was tax-free, 20% subject to tax. Got it? That's how they got their price at 30000 Cherokee built differently. They called a unibody construction. Unibody, you can guess. It's one piece. They can't separate the bottom from the top. So even if Chrysler could have duplicated what Mitsubishi was doing, it couldn't. It didn't want to because it saw it as a loophole, but more importantly, it, it, it couldn't get there. So we come back to what does Mr. Kerry Ivan do? American businessman, not long in Thailand. American. We like a level playing field. What did he do? Anybody take a guess? What would you do? Yes. Sue. <laughs> That's an option. Sue the Thai government or sue just sue the the whole gang. Just let anybody want to get sued, I'm ready. Yeah, sue. I, that's how he felt. He felt like, let's sue the whole world right now. This is an outrage. What's going on? Some kind of uh, a, arrangement between the Thai government and Mitsubishi Corp. What's what's happening? So, what does he do? He marches over to the minister in charge of investment in Thailand and basically lets him know, gives him a blast them, says, there's only one way to explain this, and that is that the Thai government is rigged up with the Japanese manufacturers, and you want us out, and you're not having a level playing field, and I suspect all kinds of wrong things are going on here, and I don't like it. I, Chrysler. 
So the Thai government said, how long have you <coughs> been here, Mr. Ivan? And how many employees do you have? Yeah. What references? So, uh, you know, in Thailand, for those of you who are Thai here or have been to Thailand, you know on your computer when you have that option, it says shut down. You know, instead of turn off, you go shut down. And the screen goes, shoo. that's Thai people. Do not be direct or confronted with Thai. It's, a, it's not going to end well. Speaking from personal experience with Ms. Mitsubishi. So I made up with her, and I actually got to see the president eventually in the interim. It wasn't long after, though, that Carrie Ivan called me one day. Mike, can you get the prime minister on the phone? Big problem. They don't want us here. So what's the deal? I told them. I told them they can't do it this way. Well, who did you tell? What did you tell, Carrie? How bad is the damage? They won't talk to me. I can't get a meeting with anybody. So because I had gone through the process of putting together this report, that also included meeting with government officials. And with the government officials, they were very cordial and friendly, and I had a good rapport with them. It was an easy thing for me. After Kerry called, I said, I think I know what's going on here. We want to be find a compromise. We don't want to go direct. So we were able, Kerry and I were able to go to the ministries and um, quickly say, look, all due respect, it's your country, your laws. We're just trying to fit in here. We want to have an understanding why Mitsubishi is subject to one tax rate and Chrysler is subject to another. Please educate us. We're really interested in putting our money here and contributing to Thai society. Can you help us out? And um, it took a while. It took more than two years and involved the ambassador for the United States in certain meetings and the ministers, the prime minister, in fact. But eventually the Thai government said, you know what? The SUV pick uh, Jeep is not a truck, pickup truck, it's not a car. It's a hybrid. It's in between the two. So we're going to set up a new tax rate specifically for all SUVs, Mitsubishi, Chrysler, and anyone else who comes in. Solution. Right. The point of the story is that that's how a company gets started. I didn't have anything going on until I'm, first I made a mistake, then a big American corporation made a mistake. And because of my er, learnings, they then came to me and said, can you sort us out? Can you help us out in this situation? OK. That was one. I, I was going to talk about a second thing that happened. Book? Yeah? OK. Any questions so far? Crystal clear. So the book, um, no, actually, I, I do have a, side, a sidebar here. In the days preparing for this, I said, uh, ask many people, the audience, I anticipate this kind of audience, what are they interested in, graduate students, people around the university? And uh, more than one person said, well, you don't want to miss the opportunity to talk about romantic relationships in Asia. <laughs> so I said, are you sure? Yeah, everybody will be interested. What happens when, how do men and women get together? Or not get together when, in Asia? Anybody here interested in knowing about that? Okay, sidebar, a little bit. I can tell you just my initial experience when I went to China. It was 1986. I was in Chongqing at the university there. And I was 20, I guess 21 years old. And um, there were four of us in the whole university. The university had something like 20,000 people. Uh, there were, I, I mean, there were no cars. There were no, there were a lot of bikes and some trucks. Uh, I made 500 renminbi a month cash, take home, net. That's about $80. China was such a place at that time that even with 500 RMB, you couldn't spend the money. There was nothing to buy. Go to town, nothing to buy. Once a week, we'd go down to the friendship store, and there'd be a few bottles of Qingdao beer left over. We'd spend all our money on Qingdao beer. There was McDonald's, KFC, anything Western wasn't there. And you just, there was nothing to buy in, in China, as hard as it could be to believe. 
So what do you do? There's nothing to buy, nothing to eat, nothing to do, no movie theaters. You're hanging out, and you get to know other people your age. Uh, I happen to meet a graduate, student, a graduate teacher who's teaching German, and her name was Wang Pu. And uh, I was interested in continuing my Chinese studies, so I said, you're a teacher of language. You know Chinese. Would you consider tutoring me? And she said, sure, why not? So uh, she began to come over to my apartment, studio apartment on campus. In those days, to visit anybody, you have to check in with the guard and sign in. And every time she came over, for after she signed in, she had an escort. The escort would walk up the second floor, down the hall with her to my door. And it's a one-room studio. The door would open. She'd go in, and the escort would stand in the doorway for the entire hour and a half of instruction until Wang Fu was ready to leave. And then, OK. That's how things go in China at that time. Of course, China today, totally different. But uh, just to give you a flavor for how things were and how things are. Um, now, the second thing I want to share with you, and that is writing a book. Uh, I asked earlier who was interested in writing a book, and I got very few hands up. Just a couple, one, two. Nobody here. All right. Uh, so how to write a book? First of all, people ask, well, do you have an agent? You need an agent. Uh, if you don't have an agent, it's hard to get an agent. And you get an agent in order to get a publisher. So not only is it hard to get a publisher, but you know, it's hard to get an agent to get a publisher. And I said, no, I don't want an agent or a publisher. I just want to write a book. And I got this great idea. And once people hear about it, they're just going to be head over heels about it. Um, that isn't how it worked out. I tried to talk to a lot of agents. They didn't have the time of day. And I got a lucky break. Friends of mine work at CNBC TV in Singapore. I'd been on the show a few times. And the producer there said, I know someone at Wiley, big publisher, US publisher, with offices in Singapore. I'll set up a meeting. I went to see Wiley. And they said, uh, good, what's your book idea? They, don't, they didn't ask me for it. Send your book idea to us, two chapters, title, and um, we'll discuss it in person. So I went to see them full of hope and optimism. And I met, they met off-site at Starbucks. I think they invited me to go to Starbucks so I wouldn't make a scene at Wiley. <laughs> I'm not sure. But we went into Starbucks, and it was kind of like my Chinese teacher when I got it wrong. Uh, uh, no, no. So I sat down. I said, here's my book. Here's my book idea. And the first question, great, uh, nice idea. Mike, who's going to read your book? Who's going to read? And I said, who's not going to read it? Are you kidding me? I mean, did you, did you read the two chapters I sent and the title? And then it quickly dawned on me. She's, she said, Mike, I look at 100 books a year. Yours isn't going to make it. So that was really a setback. I mean, set, hold on. That was a joke, right? Not going to make it? No. Uh, well, I could try to put it to the editors to see if it'll pass. They're not going to like it. That's it? Get my Starbucks and go? No book? No book. So you, you talk to people, you go, how did you write a book? Well, yeah, you just wrote it up and published, and next thing you know, it's a bestseller. No, it's, it's a rough world out there. So I went back home, and then she followed up. She said, Mike, your idea for a book is too broad. We want you to write a book on General Motors in China, a business book. And I call myself the accidental businessman because I'm not that interested in writing a business book. Definitely not interested. What? And then they did the marketing program, and the financials looked terrific. No, didn't want to write that kind of book. I wanted to write a story. So we negotiated an agreement where I would write a book about General Motors in China, but weave in the stories that I had experienced with living and working and doing business in China. Um, took about a year. It was published. Um, last year, and um, it's, was, it's been beyond my wildest dreams. Shortly after it was published, it was, inter it was reviewed by the Wall Street Journal, uh, top pick front page of the opinion page in the print edition US. And I remember thinking on that day, all right, 
I'm really, really stoked about this whole thing. I've had my fill with satisfaction. I don't need another thing from the book. I've written a book. It's been published. It's got good reviews. In fact, Wall Street Journal's reviewed it. But then the human factor comes in, and after a few days, I go, Damn, New York Times hasn't reviewed it, though, yet. <laughs> then I think, oh, Mike, you just said it was enough. And then three days later, it goes like that. So that's another element of pursuing one's past. You know. um, I'd like to maybe bring it to a little bit of conclusion and open it up to your questions with, uh, by relating a, a story I heard from uh, at a recent investor conference in Beijing. JP Morgan Investor Conference, there's 2,000 investors from all over the world who gather there. And one of the investors is a multi-billionaire named Robert Friedland. Robert Friedland, and I found myself at one dinner happened to, sit, happened to sit next to Robert Friedland. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know how much money he had, but I was at this in a Forbidden City, a beautiful little restaurant, about 20 people there. And we're talking, and he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, what do you do? He goes, I own copper mines, gold mines all over the world. Yeah, really? Go, How'd you get into that? I used to be in electronics, and I sat there in my home one day. I said, look, Plug in. What do I plug in here? I plug in my cell phone, my TV, my air conditioning, my radio, my hair dryer, refrigerator, lights, all these things being plugged in by me every single day. Multiply that by a gazillion homes around the world. Forget about electronics. The real money's in energy and mines. So about 10 years ago, he left electronics and he got into uh, this business of mining. Uh, along the way that night, he said, you know, Steve Jobs and me, you know, Steve Jobs and me, we used to be real tight. I go, and then he's sitting next to the guy, you go, yes, Steve Jobs and you used to be real tight. Okay. Can you pass the salt, please? Yeah, it's not very believable. Well, I don't know if you guys have read the book, but a year later I'm reading the book. It's like chapter three, and it says, there's probably only one person on the planet who got the better of Steve Jobs, and his name is Robert Friedland. Holy cow, that was him. They had, Robert Friedland had the apple farm where Steve Jobs stood, stayed for a while, did LSD and meditated and everything else. Uh, but uh, the reason I relate this story is he le he's a very interesting guy, Robert Friedland. He's been all over the world crazy. He's nuts. And he said, uh, I said, well, how do, you like the, how do you like the mining business? You're a billionaire. You're one of the leaders in it. You've really done well. He goes, miserable. In fact, Mining is the most miserable business you can be in. I found the most miserable business to be in. Look at all the risks. You got currency risk. You have political risk. You have fluctuations in demand. Look at China. You have competition. You don't know the price to the, tomorrow is going to be, let alone you have to bet what it's going to be five years out. All of these headaches every single day. And I said, okay, could you sum it up for me then? I mean, you've had a how would you encapsulate your experiences in life and with this mining business? He goes, well, in summary, I'd say the situation is hopeless, but it's not serious. <laughs> I love that. And uh, I thought it's beautiful wisdom for life itself. So as you guys embark on whatever you plan to do, it may often be hopeless, but it's rarely serious. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have uh, time for questions. There are mics uh, here and here uh, if you'd like to come up and uh, ask uh, whatever question you have. Uh, maybe I'll uh, exercise chair's prerogative as, you're, uh, as people are uh, thinking their questions and just ask to tell us a little about the, the move from Thailand to China and China and Indonesia, sort of what, what that process was like, what, the, you know, what the, the story was behind those moves. That one's pretty straightforward. Went to Thailand in the late in the early 90s, uh, thanks to direction from both uh, Dr. Lim and Dr. Gosling, uh, who was my, two of my mentors in school, and they, they really said, Mike, China's big, check out Southeast Asia first. So just after Tiananmen incident, looking at China, looking at Southeast Asia, it was a natural to go there first. Uh, it also was a total coincidence, lucky coincidence, the U.S. automakers went to Southeast Asia first because China was seen to be a very 
risky and difficult place. So through the 90s, staying in Thailand, Southeast Asia, Asian financial crisis hits, and all interest in business shifts north to China. So with that in mind, you know, in a business, you have to follow your customer. They were all going north. I moved up to China in the, in the 2000s. And then uh, after selling the company in 2009 and doing the earnout earn out through 2010, uh, my wife and I looked around and said, where's the place we want to live most of all in the world right now? And it was in China, uh, something about milk, baby powder, things, air pollution. Uh, and uh, so we went to Indonesia. And uh, luckily, Indonesia's economy is doing very well, and the car market's the fastest growing. I think wherever I go, I just luck out. The car market in Thailand was growing in the 90s, China in the 2000s, and now Indonesia. Yeah, I can hear you. Coming back, yeah, great question. Uh, Chinese in particular have tons of money, and they're coming back this way. And just as we Americans have tremendous difficulty adjusting to language, culture, history, context, the whole thing, they too know their business, but they don't know the context, and they will need help on the ground here. Uh, initially, they may resist it. No, we can figure this out ourselves, but quickly they'll run into trouble. I think it's a terrific time to be in America with language skills and say, hey guys, you, this is your home away from home. I'm going to make it easy for you. I think the Chinese investors will, they get that and they'll, um, they'll, they'll hunt for that kind of help. Yes? It's, it's hard to it's hard to say China, Chinese China, for our lifetimes and beyond, not only in China but globally, is going to be a force, a force. Um, however, to, I think I, what I hear in your question is, everyone's looking at China now. So what's the road less traveled or less crowded? Indonesia is a is a real dark horse very little interest in a country of 250 million people, very few people speaking the language. And just like people who go to China needed help, I can say if I'm building a, we're building a company in Indonesia now, there's lots of tricks in Indonesia too. And knowing the language we're gonna, is going to set you apart dramatically. Um, some, by some estimates, Indonesia is going to be one of the top five economies in the world 30 years from now. So something to look at, be Indonesian. Yes. Go. Uh, okay. So you would like to work in China immediately after after graduation? There's there's lots of options and. A real nice one is at university. Uh, they've got very smart, capable people in the universities. It's a good setting, and you're going to improve your language. I might recommend that as stage one, then go into business. Business in China is really, really tough. Really tough. I can't think of, if I think of a word more than tough, it quickly goes into, you know, just like, real, just tough. So. <laughs> Start, start get in there, build your network at the university, then, um, then look for opportunities on the ground. There's plenty of opportunities, people looking for capable people on the ground to help them grow their business. Maybe not Chongqing. <laughs> <laughs> yes.
Absolutely. Huge. Huge. Speak Thai. Just this afternoon, I was in Troy. I stopped to see a client in Troy. Walking toward the building, I hear, oh, I hear Thai. Three guys walking up in suits speaking Thai. I turn to them and I went Thai about how. And their shoulders relaxed, big smile. I'm inside. I'm with them now. Whereas if I don't, and that's been my experience, whether it's in China, in Indonesia, just a relaxation. And this guy or this woman has taken the time to learn my language and my culture. They got it. They're, they're, they got to be cool. Yeah. And if, if, on the other hand, when they don't, it's there's a huge gap. Not insurmountable. There's many people who go to the, the Asia and without the language, and they do, they do well. But um, usually they're several echelons up, and they're kind of like, okay, you guys, yeah, how's the numbers looking there? Yeah, we made a profit. Good, good, terrific. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes. Uh, different for the two languages. So, so Chinese, I was, I, I felt like. I, I'm going to the Olympics with my Chinese. I really had four years of intensive Chinese, and my last class was fourth year Chinese here. There are two people in the class. We're reading novels. Uh, I was going to every Chinese event on campus, speaking Chinese. One of my favorite experiences is get on the phone with someone, a Chinese person. I'll meet you at the mall in half an hour, you know, or a businessman, and then you go to the mall, and they're looking around. Where's the Chinese guy? No, oh, it's me. Oh, my God. So I was. <laughs> I was really thrilled about that. So the Chinese was solid, really solid. And, um, used to have a full head of hair before I started. Thai was just had a year and a half, and so it was more learning on the go once I got to Thai. Well, Sichuan food is tough to beat. Yeah. Love Sichuan food. Uh, the I really admire uh, China's history, in particular the Tang Song era and the art and the culture and the language and the poetry. I thought it was I thought it's, I think it's sensational. Um, I also really admire Chinese work ethic. I don't think you can find anyone in the world that works harder than Chinese people. And they don't complain. Want the work done? We're going to get it done. Um, so those are the things I like or admire. Uh, on the other hand, what's difficult about China is um, I'd say that as even with many, many years living there, working there, shoulder to shoulder with Chinese people, speaking their language, understanding their culture, there's still a significant gap between Chinese and visitors. I feel like I'm a visitor. And that's after a while you say, well, OK, I'm just a visitor, so time to go. Uh, yeah, there's a third part of your question I totally forgot. It's uh, my first impression coming back here when I come back is how trusting Overall, trusting our society is here. Trusting. Leave your car, leave your, I was at the conference, I locked my briefcase all over the place, I had jet lag. Leave it for hours out in the open. Go back, it's right there. And people, you go, I go to a store, oh, I forgot, I forgot my cash at home, can I come back tomorrow and give you the money and take this stuff now? Yeah, go ahead. Now, I, China? No. No way, baby. I mean, they trust their family, and that's it. How do you break out of that? It goes deep, it's deeply cultural. So, but Singapore is getting there, I think. More trusting, open society. I think trust is going to be the basis for the next stage of growth in China. Without that trust, uh, you know, intellectual property. In China, you guys know the expression R&D, Chinese R&D. Do you know what it stands for? Anybody? Okay, in the industry, I didn't make it up, I'm just telling you what it says. So, 
R&D re receive and duplicate. <laughs> They're masters at copying things, and they don't really feel as though it's that wrong. It's like it's right there. I can copy it. So what? What's the big deal? That kind of stuff has to has to get better if China's going to evolve into a better, stronger country. Please. Uh, from China, there's no such thing as an entitlement. No one's entitled to anything. You fight for everything you get. Some win, some lose. That's Life is not fair. So I'm not endorsing uh, a society without safety nets, but I am recognizing in China that they are realistic. Life. Who, did anyone say it was, you know, who said it was going to be fair? So they work really hard. And if we are not prepared to match that level of intensity and work, then we have to give things up. I don't think America wants to, wants to do that. So that's from, uh, from China. From Thailand, uh, Thailand, Thai people just have a, a great disposition about life, living in the moment, enjoying the saparot, enjoying this piece of pineapple. Did you taste this pineapple? No, did you taste it? No, you, I'm serious. You got to taste this pineapple. We, I'd sit at lunch with my staff sometimes at, off, at the office would go out, and the entire conversation is about, oh, try this food. This food is so delicious. Try this one. They're totally living in the moment and enjoying themselves. And there's a lightness to Thai people. They're not heavy. If, you know, they're smiling. They're enjoying the moment. I think when I come back to America, we're, we're really, our society is really churning. And I don't know if we give ourselves enough time to think about the moment, living in the moment. Um, Indonesia, <laughs> I think similar to Thailand. Slow it down. Enjoy the day. Enjoy the moment. Now, those, I said, I'm speaking of them out loud. I realize the Chinese lesson is different from the Thai lesson because the Chinese are like, go, and the Thais are like, sabai, sabai, let's just not get too, too wound up about anything. I think <clears throat> it's one, one person's opinion, so what the hell, just let it rip. Um, I think given a choice, they would probably prefer not to change and just try to hold things together. Stability is always number one. But that's what who and when did. They held on to Deng's reforms and rode them. And now the consensus on the ground in China is time's up. Deng's reforms were good. They've run their course. China must initiate new economic and political reforms or things are going to go badly. So I think Mr. Xi knows that, and he provided that he feels he has enough power, he would push in that direction of not only economic reforms, but also maybe some political ones. Um, I can say being in China often recently, it's the most uneasy time I've seen in China since Tiananmen. I'm not saying people are in the Tiananmen Square. I'm not saying that. But there's an uncertainty and a tension and uneasiness about the ground there. 
what, where's this thing going? Uh, you know, the, the legitimacy of the Communist Party has rested on its ability to provide a higher standard of living for people year after year after year. And they've done a miraculous job with that since 1980. Miraculous. Now with the economy slowing and China realizing it is subject to what happens in Europe and the United States and other parts, the economy is slowing, people's incomes are not rising, some people are not having the jobs, college graduates can't find jobs. Uh-oh, now what's the legitimacy of the party? What does its legitimacy rest on? It's a very uneasy time. Uh, they'll probably find their way through it, but they need to act. He needs to act. She needs to act. You guys are aware, uh, Xi Jinping disappeared in September for about 10 days. You guys all, show of hands, you guys all follow that. For me, that was um, just remarkable. Even though I've spent so many years in China, it would be like Governor Romney or President Obama, nope, can't, haven't seen him. Sorry, <laughs> don't, don't know. And then the reporters who are friends of mine from the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg, they do the daily trot over the Foreign Affairs Department, and they give a daily briefing. And they'd always ask the same question. Where is she? Where is she? And the answer was, don't ask the question. You asked that question yesterday, don't ask it again. I told you yesterday that I have no information about it, so don't ask it. Don't ask it. So these people went every day, and then one day one of them got up the courage to say, is she alive? And the guy said, I wish you'd ask a serious question, but, and I don't want you to ask any questions. Okay. For a better part of two weeks, the incoming president of the world's most uh, second most powerful economy has gone missing. Then later, he, how did he reappear? National TV touring the university. Here he is, Mr. Xi at the Beijing Institute of Agriculture. Terrific. Any reason he just reappeared? Any explanation? then you don't get any, except rumors that he hurt his back, swimming. You know how that can happen. And recently, for the first time in, in memory, right, there's, there has been political unsettling, opposition, and expressions of discontent with the status quo. Having said that, Indo uh, Singapore is an oasis in Asia. You, you go into Indonesia, you go to the Philippines, you go to China, come back to Indone Sing sorry, Singapore, and you take a deep breath and relax because everything is buttoned up, modern, transparent, convenient, clean, safe. It's like, wow, don't get rid of Singapore. Just <laughs> keep it there. <clears throat> so uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big bull on Singapore, and I think they'll find their way through the political process. That's right. That's right. It's really transforming into an international place. I don't know what to call it. A nation of international people. Linda, help me out here. I don't know what to call it. Welcome. Can I ask a question? Uh, why, um, you always ask tough ones, though. Okay. <laughs>
I think the short story writer Lu Xun long ago put it well, at least for the Chinese, and I think this applies to all Asians, is that he said Chinese people never see foreigners as, they always see them as either like a god or a barbarian, <coughs> and never as equals. And I think that's largely true in my experience. Either people really look up to Americans as a fount of a spirit of independence, freedom, optimism, or they think Americans are just there to grab as much money as possibly can and get out. Um, and there's reasons why they think that. <clears throat> you know, for much of our lifetimes, America's been the unrivaled superpower, and its businesses have been very aggressive in Asia. Both of those have been true. Um, I think they're not so comfortable with saying, oh, yeah, Americans are just like us, or we're on a par with, with foreigners or Americans. Um, second part. Oh yeah. I, I think I think yeah. I'm myself. I'm myself. Now I'm aware. You're, you got to be yourself, but you're always aware of your context, your, where you are. So um, in Thailand, always quiet is better. Don't be loud. Don't be direct. Be patient. Smile. I remember one time running very, very late for a flight in Thailand, and uh, I thought it's like 10 minutes to the, I'm getting there. Uh, that's not going to happen. So I went up and I, I said, uh, the only shot I have at this is to smile and not say anything. So I got up there, big smile, and she goes, if you didn't smile, there's no way you'd get on the flight, but okay. <laughs> bam. Um, China, China is, China, I, I myself, but I also gird myself for, um, they're very competitive people right now, very ambitious people. So they say in business, if you're going to go to China and do your business, bring your very best game. Because if there's any weakness in it, you're going to lose and there won't be any, any tear shed. Too bad. Good Samaritan doesn't play in China. You're at the side of the road. Don't be something like that. Uh, Indonesia, um, similar to Thailand, just stay cool, be patient, be patient. How many people have been to Indonesia here? All right. I th we, when we moved to Indonesia two years ago, I'd been in, already in Asia for the better part of 20 years. I got, I got this nailed. I mean, I know Thailand, I've been to China, this is going to be a vacation after China, smooth, let me just sail this thing in. And I've had arguably the toughest transition of the three countries in Indonesia. It looks inviting and smooth on the surface, but a lot of, a lot of stuff happening under there. A lot of, lot of difficulties. Patience. Join me in thanking uh, Mike for his wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.